Okay. We have a terrific, terrific lineup uh, again today. And uh, our, our opening speaker is uh, none other than TJ Rogers, founder, president, CEO of Cypress Semiconductor, former se chairman of the Semiconductor Industry Association, sits on the board of directors of clean tech companies like Bloom, Cypress Enviro Systems, and SunPower. Uh, he's testified before Congress five times. He's a notorious free market advocate, uh, advocates eliminating corporate subsidies. He's encouraged Cyprus to play an active role in the development of alternative energy, which many of you know. Um, and it's really for the goal of increasing shareholder value. Uh, Cyprus made the initial investment in Sun Power, as many of us know, in 2002. Uh, so he's been doing this for a long time, caring about this space. I think right now, uh, Cyprus has this goal of a five year plan to make 100% uh, of Cyprus's energy uh, reliant on alternative energy. And I think headquarters is now 75% supplied by renewable energy, predominantly I think solar and fuel cells. Uh, for anyone who knows TJ, dedicated, unabashed free market capitalists, and we continue the summit's track record here of bringing speakers with real opinions and leaders who aren't afraid to share their viewpoints. When I was uh, taking a look at some of what TJ's written recently, I'm going to give you a, just a quick taste of what you're about to hear and read you a couple quotes from TJ. He said, Washington's a black hole. You send money into it. It burns half your money. And then after burning half your money, the other half comes back in the form of political pork barrel. The loser's game is to send your squealers to Washington to see if they can get a bigger piece of the pork and the, than the other guy's squealers. I refuse to participate in it. And you know, I, you're going to hear uh, more from TJ. I, I, I think you know, I had the privilege of chairing the 2010 NVCA annual meeting. That meeting has brought in people historically like uh, Eric Schmidt from Google, Lou Gerstner, Barry Diller, Edgar Bronfman, Michael Bloomberg, Lance Armstrong, a number of others. I can tell you, when we got the audience feedback, the guy who was rated, rated the highest among all the speakers was TJ Rogers. It was at that point I said to myself, we have got to get him to come to Palm Springs, speak to the Clean Tech Investor Summit. I appreciate him accepting the invitation. It's my privilege to welcome TJ Rogers. Dealing with the devil, <clears throat> will the green, will green save the economy? And here I'm talking about the dichotomy of environmentalism, the business side or the venture side. Can you create a product that people want and will pay for and can you make a profit on it? and benefits society in that way. And then the other side of environmentalism, which I'll just call the environmentalists. And I want to talk about that dichotomy. <clears throat> I should point out to you that I have a conflict here. I'm a shareholder in SunPower. I'm chairman, actually. Cypress Enviro and Bloom Energy, all energy companies. Therefore, if the government passes a mandate, you have to do so much green, et cetera, um, I'll make money on it. And you'll see I, I'm going to violate this conflict of interest royally today. <clears throat> As investors, uh, here are my opening recommendations to you that I'll come back to over time. One, be a global warming skeptic. I am. Two, do not rely for long, there's a little window, on government funding. Three, demand standalone economic viability for your companies. Do it the old-fashioned way, superior talent, superior technology, and a relentless drive based on self-interest, IPO, for example. Do it the very old-fashioned way, believe in free markets and believe in the Bill of Rights, something that does get trampled on uh, with the environment. Believe in the First Amendment, the freedom of speech to have a contrary opinion without getting beat down. Uh, control A, there's my arrow. Uh, the Fourth Amendment, uh, private property rights, including mandates which force you to do things with your property you would not otherwise do. And the Tenth Amendment, limited government, all powers not specifically enumerated, you know that one. And finally, as investors, run like hell when you hear any of the following. Green jobs, green economy, government industry partnership, carbon tax, or double bottom line. You know, the, the one bottom line you report to shareholders, the, the, the sort of old fashioned one, and the real bottom line, your environmental bottom line. Um, I've been this way for a while. This is a 1991 uh, journal. Uh, I opposed Semitech, which was a big subsidy after we were going to get killed by the Japanese. I don't know if you remember that, but Japanese were going to wipe out semis. And the solution was, of course, to give us money. I testified against it, uh, which called me to be labeled the bad boy, which I so proud of. Obviously, I'm still showing it you know, 20 years later. <clears throat> Senate testimony. Um, this is to a, a Senate committee 
The title was Declaration of Independence and Corporate Welfare. Uh, I tested, uh, testified against corporate welfare, that is, don't give my company money. My example was don't take money from my, my fifth grade school teacher mother in Wisconsin who can't afford it and give it to our company and the other of the richest companies in the world here in Silicon Valley. It doesn't make sense. I found out when I was going to that testimony that they had set me up. We had seven people on the panel, six of whom saw the higher good, namely government gives money to the semiconductor industry. <clears throat> And they were all going to testify how it was good. And then we had one straw man, me, and I was going to be painted as the kook who had uh, separate ideas that, that you shouldn't really believe that much. I found this out the day before. I inferred it from a conversation with a staffer when I was getting my timing limits and stuff like that. So in one day, I called up my buddies. <clears throat> I faxed them all a statement and asked them to sign it. The high taxes that our company and its employees pay to support the current local state government Tax burden of 35%, by the way, it's not 45%, second only to World War II. 35% of GDP hurts our economy more than any possible corporate benefit from government spending. If an independent commission, similar to the military base closing commission, identified a fair and substantial government spending cut in the area of so-called corporate welfare, I would support that cut even if it meant funding cuts to my own company. Jerry Sanders, founder of Advanced Micro Devices, then we go on to the list, John Doerr signed. Uh, these are CEOs and partners uh, of venture capital firms and legal firms. So I handed that out and I pointed out that I was speaking for a broad consensus of CEOs in Silicon Valley, not just the kook. Um, I received this letter. It hangs over my desk. It's one of my proudest things. <clears throat> the letter is from Milton Friedman. T Dear TJ, I've been meaning for days to congratulate you on your absolutely splendid article follow-up in the Wall Street Journal. If we had only a few people, more people like you with the courage to speak out and express their views plainly without equivocation. But because you are so few, we value all the more highly congratulations. So I can't say good stuff about myself, but I always read that to people. <clears throat> um, <laughs> turns out he called me. He called me. And my secretary says, uh, you know, I, I'm a 10-year CEO of the company, 300 million bucks. You know, we're one of 99 startups. And my secretary says, Milton Friedman's on the phone. And I said, oh, yeah, right. Has he got Sir Walter Raleigh in a can? You know, <laughs> she says, no, I really think it is Mr. Friedman. So I, so I picked up the phone, and I actually got to meet him. And I had a question for him, because we had acquired a company called Silicon Light Machines, which had a government contract, not a subsidy, but a contract. We were making something for the government. And the guys on the other side, the government industry partnership lobbyists, who had been working trying to figure out how to put the case together against the kook to show that he was wrong, um, they said, TJ's a hypocrite. You know, he takes money from the government. We're building an optical, some kind of optical device. And yet he rails against corporate welfare. He's a hypocrite. So I asked Milton about that. I asked him if I should dump that contract to become philosophically pure. And this was a conversation typical of Friedman, a genius, who in almost every case they interacted with him would say one paragraph and it was like silver bullet goes in your head and you go, this is it, I get it, thank you very much. Conversation went like this. Uh, should I give up my subsidy? Do you believe in a flat tax? Yes, why? It removes the deduction game, the government's meddling in personal choices and eliminates the billions of dollars of tax preparation overhead. Good. Then of course you're not going to take any deductions on your income tax this year, right? <clears throat> No, why? Because the 18% flat tax rate is not passed yet, and I would pay about 55% of my income without deduction. So you will take every deduction legally available to you under the current law, even as you argue that the flat tax is better for the economy. Yes. So why would you do any less for your shareholders? Click. OK, thanks, Milton. This is, this is why the little paren for long is in my, my it's not an equivocation. <clears throat> Get everything they're entitled to and still argue for an end to government subsidies. Do not rely for long on government funding. Most recent article I wrote just a couple months ago before the election against Prop 23. This is, of course, the carbon tax in California, and it was also a green energy mandate. Um, I can only tell you that this did not make me very popular at SunPower. There was actually an internal lobbying effort calling me up. What are you doing? Uh, by the way, run like hell, a carbon tax. Sunpower story, how to make money on green. It can be done, but you've got to be careful and you can't abandon your basic principles. Uh, this is the roof of our headquarters building. Those are the Santa Cruz Mountains where my vineyard is right about there. <clears throat> um, in 2000, we had a new building. We put on 350 kilowatts of solar, produced one third of our energy, and the payback was seven years. So I saw the future of solar. 
the one thing I learned from this experience is even though we paved the roof, every square foot we could get uh, with panels, <clears throat> we only got a third of our energy, so it went into my head. These 14% panels weren't good enough, and if you could get double the number of watts per square meter, you could get 66% of your building's power instead of 33%. <clears throat> Later, I met an old friend of mine. He and I were in the same PhD program at Stanford, the Integrated Circuits Laboratory. Uh, Dick Swanson, <clears throat> he had founded Sun Power. Sun Power was a 20-year-old company. They were doing only a few million a year. They were losing money. And he told me he was about to uh, lay off half the people in his company. This was Christmas of 2000. What do you make? I make solar cells. What's your, what's your, what's your better mousetrap? Our solar cells of 21% efficiency versus 14 for the other guys. You get one and a half times more energy per cell. Click. There it was. <clears throat> so I went to my board. And by the way, this is 2001. It was about to happen. The board knew it. I'd been investing in all these little things. Board was a little uptight with TJ's uh, crazy ideas. So I go to my board. Let's invest in solar. No. <clears throat> all right. I'll give you a pitch. So I go in, solar energy, ROI, seven years. Put it on your roof. It's going to be a big deal. And we all, I only need $7 million. Mm, no. <clears throat> Took me 15 months to get them to invest. So I had to write a personal check, best check I ever wrote, uh, for three quarters of a million bucks to uh, keep his company floating. <clears throat> uh, superior talent. This is some part as early uh, investment that I made, their product. Uh, this is in Australia. Basically, you concentrate the sun on the super high, high efficiency cell. That's why they specialize in high efficiency. You can't get too much efficiency when all of this overhead focuses onto one cell. Um, and we were going to bring this to the U.S. and have fields of trackers tracking the sun. Little problem was when a cloud went over the sun, <laughs> the tracker kind of lost track of where the sun was. And sometimes it started sort of scanning around looking for the sun and it would, you know, like burn holes through, start grass fires and burn cars. <clears throat> so uh, they decided it wasn't a safe product and we never got to import it. Okay, there's my 750 gone. Meanwhile, uh, SunPower got a government contract and they built the solar cells that paved the wings of the solar airplane. Uh, this area right here, uh, 1,350 square feet, or 1,750, uh, produces 39,000 watts of power and it's capable of flying with uh, two horsepower, 14 motors, two horsepower each. The, the propellers are so huge because at 96,000 feet where this airplane had a ceiling, it's practical ceiling, uh, the air is so thin you need almost like windmills to grab enough air to move the airplane along. By the way, the uh, service altitude of an F-15 Eagle is 76,000 feet. So this is a real airplane, took off and landed under its own power. That led to the A-300 cell, as we call it, that we helped them develop in 2003. They were good scientists, but they had no clue about how to uh, manufacture things. <clears throat> we're in the chip business. We make 150 million things every quarter. If our quality isn't PPM defective, our returns would wipe us out. So we showed them how to manufacture. This is the front and back side of the sun power cell. It's a high efficiency cell, 21%. The contacts are on the back, both the anode and cathode, plus and minus. So the metal doesn't reflect light. In the case of that dish, the metal would have evaporated with that concentrated light on it. <clears throat> and the front side is, as you can see, very black. And black means no light's coming back at you, and that's exactly what you want. And this anti-reflective coating is very interesting. This is a picture of a scanning electron microscope, five micron between the clicks here, of the front of the wafer. So that blackness actually looks black like that. <clears throat> and these little pyramids grab the light and bring it in. Interesting uh, deja vu for me. Uh, I wrote my dissertation at Stanford when I was with Swanson on making transistors on the faces of these crystals, and therefore, like an accordion, packing more transistors into a given surface area. Um, it crashed, but it was a nice idea. Good enough for a PhD. Um, 2001, um, we were looking at what was going to have to happen to module pricing. Um, back when the cumulative shipments of, of modules was one megawatt, they were $62 a watt. And if, unless you were flying a satellite, you couldn't afford them. <clears throat> and over time, they'd come down. This is a classic learning curve, the logarithm of volume uh, and the logarithm of price. And, by the time we got into um, sun, uh, sun Power, the price was 367, and we extrapolated that it would be down to 211. By the way, 1,000 megawatts or a gigawatt is the size of a typically large power plant. So if you think one of those domes, and Diablo Canyon Nuclear Plant has two domes, that's a gigawatt just for your, uh, to visualize this. And by the way, the price is now down to 211 or even lower. 
Uh, so this prediction did happen. The market was growing like a rocket. We were having the opportunity to replace one, two, and three power plants. Um, the, the interesting thing that I liked was I wasn't selling to the government. The two biggest segments were on-grid residential, put it on your house, and on-grid commercial, put it on my headquarters building. So we had a nice private market to sell into, and that's what we did. Uh, this is a retrofit uh, where you put panels on a roof that already exists. I'll talk more about that later. Um, in 2007, the solar supply chain looked like this. Um, a six-inch wafer, and you can see the ingot by the round corners, sawed to five inches square, uh, cost 250 a watt. This is uh, 3.1 watts, and, and therefore it's about 750 for the wafer. Uh, you put them in a panel, it costs another dollar per watt to put them under in, with tempered glass and in, a, in a panel and insulate it and make it reliable. And then, interestingly enough, more than half the cost was all the stuff you had to do to put it on the roof. So learning how to install things cheaply became, that was the second big lesson, was more important than making a cheap watt on a wafer level. Um, again, SunPower was 21 percent, three watts per wafer, the industry two watts per wafer, 14 percent. So in one pair of numbers, this is SunPower's advantage. They also learned how to make these wafers, three mask wafers, P diffusion, N diffusion, contact metal, front side uh, patterning and, and contacting, all of that work for 750. FYI, it cost me $10 to put photoresist on one wafer for one mask layer. So mask, a, a, a wafer costs us about $800, and one of our mask layers, just the photoresist, costs 10 bucks. So SunPower makes a three mask wafer out the door, including the cost of the wafer, which is about two bucks for $7.50. So the next thing I learned was it's made out of silicon. It looks like a wafer. It's got nothing to do with your business. I was going to give SunPower a free fab, and they said, if you gave us the fab, we'd sell the equipment and use it to fund the company because we can't afford to run it. <clears throat> also, it's big. Uh, SunPower is now 400 megawatts a year. At that time, our, our stretch goal was to get to 100 megawatts per year. That's 32 million wafers a year, which is two tons of silicon a day. So this fab is not people in bunny suits running around with blue boxes going to machines. This fab is a forklift comes in in the morning with a ton of silicon. And then at midnight, the forklift comes in again with another ton of silicon. And it's not one fab. They now have 26 fabs, 26 automated lines. I'm going to show you later. So we were going to give them a free fab, but as you'll see, <coughs> it just wasn't in the cards. We had to start from scratch. Uh, we knew we had to be offshore. We went to Manila because Cypress had an assembly and test plant there, and I knew how to work in the country and build a, build a plant there. We bought a used disk drive plant from Hitachi, got it real cheap. Um, we stripped it out, uh, put a, a, a you know, 1980s vintage clean room in it, which is all you need for solar, uh, put in our equipment, and we took off. That's Tom Warner, the CEO of SunPower. He was a Cypress executive, and he was offered the chance to uh, run SunPower and during, <laughs> during the next three years, he made way more money than I did. So congratulations, Tom. That's the uh, president of the Philippines, Gloria Macabagal Arroyo, opening our plant. And this picture makes a single point. Green jobs are mostly offshore. If you're making stuff in a factory, you're competing against the Chinese. You're not going to make it in Fremont, California. Just ask Solyndra. Ain't going to happen. And, and typically, the green jobs are going to be 60 to 90 percent in number, not dollars, but in number offshore. That's one of the reasons is green jobs save the economy stuff. I just look at the demographics, and I just don't see it. OK, sun power. <clears throat> it's a giant line. You saw the room. The silicon doesn't go in one wafer at a time into a $4 million machine. The wafers go in four wide. Today, they go in six wide. They go in, in a conveyor belt that run continuously 24 hours a day. So it's a razor blade factory that just runs all the time. Um, this is an etcher. Uh, and you see how long it is. The wafers roll on these rollers face down. Uh, it's modified printed circuit board equipment. We can't afford any semiconductor equipment. So what we do is we take printed circuit board equipment and upgrade it to run wafers. And it took us two and a half years. We almost died getting that machine to work. It comes from a company that used to be called Holmuller, no longer around in Germany. 
And the little failure mode, and I've seen it happen with a movie, is as the wafers are moving along, they're very light, there's spray coming up on them, they start rattling around, and a wafer takes a nosedive into one of those little rollers. The next wafer nosedives into it, they start piling up, and then you get a block of silicon about that big, and then the whole thing goes wham down to the bottom of the machine broken in the hydrofluoric acid. Shut off the machine, clean it out, day later, try it again. Two years to get that to work. <clears throat> This is lithography. Uh, our line of space in our industry is under a tenth of a micron, excuse me, uh, 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 is on the order of 100 nanometers today, 0.01 microns. And this is their lithography machine. Their line of space is 100 microns, so it's very crude, more like super printed circuit board than, than big chip. It, I told you before, it took us 10 bucks to do a lithography step. They do a lithography step for a nickel. And that's a general statement, and I, I tell investors, I tell equipment companies all the time, your machines have to be 10 times cheaper than the equivalent silicon machine, A, and B, they have to run wafers 10 times faster. So for example, you buy, let's say a stepper for, uh, today it's 40 million for the high end, but let me take a reasonable number, $10 million, and it runs 60 wafers an hour, 10 million has to go to 1 million, and 60 wafers an hour has to go to 600. You need an order of magnitude on two parameters, and if you can't do that, we're not going to talk to you about equipment. <clears throat> and, and we had an, an effect event, invent all the equipment for this line. This is a metal plating line, uh, 26 microns of copper. Uh, you can see the scale of the thing. What you don't see is this line goes for 100 feet off the edge of the pi picture, <clears throat> because it takes a long time to put on that much copper. When we're all done, here's the sun power panel. I used to be polite and say this is a competing panel. Then I would explain it was ugly, wires hanging out, you know, less power, bigger, blah, blah, blah. I can now reveal to you, since I want to, that's British Petroleum's panel right there. Um, we got famous, you know, all, all of my life I'm trying to explain to somebody what a packet buffer and a stepper is, and they start falling asleep before I get done with my second sentence. And everybody gets home makeover, and everybody got the idea that in Arizona and here as well, if you put only 10 panels on your house, your meter's going to go backward most of the daylight hours. We franchised all over the U.S. and started selling all over the U.S. <clears throat> we acquired a company called Powerlight that had been in Berkeley. Powerlight took our, our solar cells, you see there's a sun power cell in there, and made these nice attractive roof shingles that are exactly the form factor. So the idea was don't paste sun power on, on your roof after the fact, build your new house with sun power shingles on it and integrate it, it's even cheaper. PowerLight also gave us the ability to do big scale projects. So this is a 924 kilowatt carport in uh, San Diego Naval Base. They also have trackers. So this tracker, the way it works, is one half horsepower motor controls not only this row of panels, which might be 50 panels, but it runs this bar back and forth, and it actually can run uh, like 10 rows of panels. So you're, you're looking at 100 panels being controlled by a, a little motor. And what it does is it simply rotates the panels like a Venetian blind during the day, <clears throat> and with that, uh, you get 35% more kilowatt hours per per peak watt, uh, because you're always perpendicular to the sun. Now, of course, the angle of the sun in the sky, you can't accommodate that because you're parallel to the ground. But in one dimension, anyway, you're always uh, perpendicular to the sun. Uh, this is 10 acres of Venetian blinds in Germany. <clears throat> this is 6.3 megawatts of power. And these things run, you can see the blocks. There's one block run by one motor uh, doing its Venetian blind thing. Now. You notice the water there. Why anybody would want to put solar in Germany where there is very little sunlight is beyond me, but their government likes it, and they want to buy it from us, and they pay us enough to make profit. Therefore, I don't opine on the uh, economic reality of what they're doing <coughs> much. Um, this is a second tracker. The same idea. It rotates in this direction to track with the sun, but in this case, is tilted to half the latitude to the excuse me the latitude angle, uh, so it, it provides pseudo perpendicularity in one dimension and perfect perpendicularity in another direction. And it, it, by the way, can give 50 percent more power per panel. <coughs> This is the biggest installation we ever did. It was uh, 2008. It's 15 megawatts, uh, 40 gigawatt hours per year, 100 million bucks, 140 acres. Uh, this is Nellis Air Force Base, California, which is not far from here. Uh, if you go inside and look at it, it looks like this. <clears throat> So there are all the trackers I said uh, laid out. Sun power at that time it improved its advantage to get the installation cost down. So you notice all he did was grade 
the desert. They didn't do anything else. They had prefab concrete and they came in and just laid the stuff down on, on centers that were surveyed. They were in and out there. By far the fastest getting an installation done from the time they get the PO of any of the solar companies. Well, they made a lot of money. In 2008, their revenue went up to 1.4 billion. Uh, this year, their forecast analyst is to double that again to 2.8 billion. <clears throat> their pre-tax profit went up. They got to 206 million dollars. This is the year we spun them out, and they stopped being a Cypress subsidiary. Um, they'll they'll do better this year. <clears throat> we got famous. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger came in to our plant. Uh, President Obama came into an installation. This is the Venetian blind type in uh, Florida uh, at Florida Power and Light. Um, and Sun Power in general was a home run, a way to make money, emphasize make money in green. And we invested $140 million at $274 per share. Uh, in return, we took out $677 in cash and bought back Cypress shares with it to basically buy back those shares and some more. And then we spun out in a tax-free spin out all of SunPAR to our shareholders, which is 2.5 billion. So the overall, the return was 3.2 billion at an average of 61.38 a share, including the, the weighted average of those two. And our return on investment was 22.4 to one. So it was, a, it was a home run for us. What's happened since? Well, just before we spun them out, their stock price was 71 bucks. One and one half years later, their stock price is 16 bucks, and today it's about the same, a little, little bit lower, like 15. And as you can see, uh, something happened. Back to basic principles, there was a German subsidy cap. We don't know if we want to continue to buy solar. The Italian subsidy was uncertain. They were arguing about it. Greek had, Greece had a meltdown. Uh, the solar industry as a, as a collection of companies went from 150 to $40 billion in revenue. And we get back to do not rely for long on government funding. It will always get you if you keep yourself in harm's way. Free markets. You have to have a customer that cares and is willing to pay. This is an index of leading environmental indicators from the Pacific Research Institute. Uh, Pew did the research for them. And this is top priorities for 2009. The economy, jobs, terrorism, global warming. You have to have customers. So although many people make a career of global warming, the fact is uh, the average consumer does not care that much. And you have to make sure that you offer an economic proposition to them. Your utility bill will go down. And over a three-year period, the savings in your utility bill will be more than you paid for the panels. And after that, you get free electricity. Demand standalone economic viability and believe in free markets. Copenhagen. Uh, I love the city. That's Copenhagen Harbor. For those of you who've been there, there's a park. We're out in the harbor. They have on a rock a bronze statue of the Little Mermaid, Hans Christian Andersen's Little Mermaid. <clears throat> the Copenhagen Summit happened in 2009. The environmentalists attending the Copenhagen Summit flew in with 140 private jets and rented 1,200 limos. They consisted of government officials, academic and the academics, and the press. Their goal was to limit and tax carbon dioxide. They failed. They were lecturing us on what to do right as they displayed that behavior. By the way, if you want to, if you really want to screw up in CO2, you know, your little CO2 footprint thing, just fly your private jet. You're really doing a job. Six, thousand, six tons of CO2 every time you take a modest flight. Now, just to illustrate the philosophical rift between that crowd and the rest of the world, this statue, this area has been modified. And this is what it looks like today. A second bronze statue has been added. That's you. You are members of the overdeveloped world, ODW. You have a lot of fat and appendages that are baggier than they should be. And oh, by the way, your, your burdensome weight is on the shoulders of the developing world. That's you. You are not a true believer. This is what you are, and you need to change it. So now we get to the second point. First of all, the environment as a business opportunity. The second point is the environment as a religion. And by a secular religion, I mean a non-God-based religion. Religion, things that you believe in without needing proof. You either believe in the Holy Ghost or you don't believe in the Holy Ghost. There is no chemistry test that's going to figure it out or no, no scanning test. And this religion has true believers. <clears throat> this goes back a long time. These attacks on free markets are, are, are old. In 1968, uh, I was still at Dartmouth. And a Stanford professor, Paul Ehrlich, uh, wrote a book called The Population Bomb. 
And the book started out this way. This is actually my copy. I read the book. <clears throat> The battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 70s and 80s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. Well, of course, the only crash program I see is the crash program called The Biggest Loser on television, where people are trying to figure out how to get down from 400 pounds down to 150 pounds. So this philosophy is an old one. Population, when unchecked, increases in a geometrical ratio. Substance increases only in an arithmetic ratio. Slight acquaintance with the numbers will show the immensity of the first power in comparison with the second. Thomas Malthus, British economist, 1798. So we were already overloading the world back, back in 1798. Our position requires that we take immediate action at home and promote effective worldwide action, says the Stanford professor. We must have population control at home, hopefully through changes in our value system, if you listen to me, but by compulsion if voluntary methods fail. <clears throat> so now we have what I call coercive utopian. They have their idea of the world the way it should be, and they're willing to force you to, to follow their ideal. And that obviously flies in the face of limited government and the belief in our Constitution. <clears throat> Can scare tactic. California will be unlivable. He went Randian. He wrote a little novelette in the uh, fourth chapter of the book to illustrate what the world was going to be like, by the way, 20 years ago. This is 20 years ago what the world was like. I, I missed it. So this, again, is a novelette. No, of course it can't. Even with rationing, a lot of Americans are going to starve to death unless this climate change reverses. We've seen the trends clearly since the early 70s, but nobody believed it would happen here. Even after the 1976 Latin American famine and the Indian dissolution, almost a billion human beings starved to death in the last decade. Second quote, this was the professor in this book had to go to Caltech, and his wife was thinking about that. But, but Pasadena, Caltech was no longer a pleasant place to work. That's right, by the way, where we are pretty close. Um, and Pasadena had never, in her experience, been a pleasant place to live. She could always picture what smog was doing to Peter and Julia's lungs. She didn't want to go back to carrying a purse full of quarters for the breath of life machines. Although the machines had appeared around Washington in the last few years, the one minute of oxygen they supplied was not yet a matter of life and death. Pasadena was another story. Well, of course, any of you who live in California, as I have, and I came here in 1970, know that the air in California is extraordinarily cleaner in every way than it was in 1970. My defining moment, I came to Stanford in the summer in a brown soup, and I came from Wisconsin where the air was clear, and it wasn't very pleasant, and the first rain came in November, and I got up one day and I looked, and I saw across San Francisco Bay, and I saw the hills on the other side of the bay, and I'd been there for two months, and I never saw them once. That's what the air was like when I came to California. It's a hell of a lot better right now. This is EPA data. It shows changes over 25 years, ending in 2005. 96% virtually all of lead out of the atmosphere, ozone, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide. And at the very same time, we've burned more coal, doubled automobile miles, truck miles, and doubled our GDP. So, the economy has been going well, and the, and the air has been getting cleaner. Why is that? Well, I think we all know it. You have to be a somewhat rich country to be able to afford the luxury of working on the environment. If feeding your children and keeping them alive is all you do, you don't care about the environment. You can't afford to. Fact. We're getting fatter, not starving. Ehrlich was wrong. This is a report from the president. The U.S. farm sector has evolved dramatically over time. Here's a table from the report. 100 years of structural change in U.S. agriculture. Farm share of population percent. So in 1900, 39% uh, of us had the farm to feed the rest. By the way, that figure was 95% at the founding of the United States. And that has gone continuously down such that today, 1% of our, us farm and the other 99% of us can go to Palm Springs and talk to each other about how the 1% is screwing up the environment with fertilizer and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> So if, if obviously if we were starving, more and more people would be forced to grow their own food, and it's just simply not happening. He's just plain, flat-ass wrong. And by the way, if you listen to the guy in, in his, last, his last pronouncements, he says, I'm absolutely right. You see it's going to happen. It's just, I just mispredicted the time frame. Now here's what you do about it. The American ambassador to the United Nations, and what many people consider the most important political statement in human history, 
comma, proposed an international survival tax, IST on the overpopulated nations, that's you, the, the fat lady in the back of the little guy, on the overdeveloped nations to be paid to the underdeveloped countries, largely through the United Nations. It proposed that it should be graduated according to each company's per capita income. Uh, the American ambassador announced that the U.S. would have an IST tax of 4% of gross national product. 4% of our money goes to tax us. Socialism replaces free markets. This is not about whether or not you're a socialist or free market capitalist. It's about whether or not you believe the true religion. And oh, by the way, if you don't like a tax of 4% of all of our wealth, the U.S. would again double its IST to 8% in 1980. Chapter 5, Prologue. What can you do or epilogue? The question I most frequently asked after giving talks about the population explosion is, what can I do to help? The obvious first answer is set an example. Don't have more than two children. So now altruism replaces individualism even for family matters. You have children according to what the government wants. There's only one country in the world that does that. I've had, an encourage, I've had encouraging letters from all over the world. People on radio and television have been extremely helpful. And the press is uncritically, and I mean uncritically, on their side. And if you saw this once, don't answer. Who is this man? Isn't it interesting? I don't think Paul Ehrlich has ever saved a life. This guy saved a billion lives. He's a Nobel Prize winner. His name is Dr. Norman Borlaug. In 1944, when Borlaug arrived in Mexico, the nation was in the grip of a crop failure. When he left Mexico in 63, the harvest had increased by a factor of six. He has arguably saved more lives than anyone in history, maybe a billion. So as our farm requirement goes from 39% to 1%, he's the guy that led the scientific revolution on how to grow crops more cheaply and more efficiently to feed us better. Zero population growth, by the way, is already happening in many places um, without government force except for China. This is a graph of the fertility rate. So between 2.1 in America and 2.33 world rate, these two lines represent ZPG. Uh, these are the various countries and were graphed during GDP per capita, the income in effect uh, per capita. The U.S. is here. We're already near the ZPG rate. Uh, Europe's already below the ZPG rate. The world is not, but it's been coming down the curve. Uh, China's already way below it by mandate. And the point here is that it is the poorest countries that don't have ZPG. They need five children to hope that their children will take care of them when they get old at age 40. What we should do is help these people develop businesses and become ec economically productive. And this curve would go right on down. Second attack came in 1972. The limits to growth came out of MIT. The headline making report on the imminent global disaster facing humanity and what we can do about it before time runs out. One of the most important documents of our age, Anthony Lewis, New York Times. The press is uncritically on their side. First page, I do not wish to seem overdramatic, but I can only conclude from the information that is available to me as Secretary General that the members of the United Nations have perhaps 10 years left in which to subordinate their ancient quarrels and launch a global partnership to curb the arms race to improve the human environment to defuse population explosion. 1969, Utant, Secretary General. This was the tipping point argument. I don't know that we went by it, right? We had only 10 years in 69. That's 79, and, and we passed over it. Uh, this is the man that said that. He was Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, he's from Burma, now called Myanmar, one of the most repressive and poor countries on the face of the earth. He was a headmaster in a, in a teaching institute, and he ran the Ministry of Information, what every poor country needs, not a Ministry of Agriculture, but a Ministry of Information. Quote, the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence clamors to be led to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, all of them imaginary. 1918, H.L. Mencken, all-time libertarian journalist. My way is the only way, part two. Decisions are being made every day in every part of the world that will affect the physical, economic, and social conditions of the world system for decades to come. These decisions cannot wait for perfect models. You need to take what I've got now. 
They will be made on the basis of some model. We'll feel that the model described here is already sufficiently developed, and I'll show you the model, to be of some use to decision makers. Furthermore, the basic behavior modes have already, that we have already observed in this model appear to be so fundamental and general that we do not expect our broad conclusions to be substantially altered. So we got a half-assed model, but it's close enough. Do what we're telling you because we're smart. Intellectual arrogance, and I call them, in my company, we've got plenty of prima donnas, and my phrase for them is higher life form. So when you're in a meeting with me and you're, you're being a little bit arrogant and explaining how the other guys are dumb and how you're smart, I, I always ask the rhetorical question, so you must be a higher life form than the person you're talking about. And everybody understands when they hear that, that key word from me, it's time to you know, notch it down a little bit. If the present growth trends in world population, industrialization, pollute, food production, and resource depletion continue unchanged, the limits to growth of this planet will be reached sometime within the next 100 years. Now, he was smarter. So unlike, <laughs> unlike Ehrlich, who proved himself wrong, you know, instantly, the book was, you know, barely out, uh, this guy gave him a chance, himself a chance to die before he got proved wrong. <laughs> now, s sometimes higher life forms have to proclaim their higher life forms. And this is a graph of a space and time, and it shows you where higher life forms are. And I see obviously the lower life forms are down here, and obviously the higher life forms, there are just a few of them, are here. So if your time frame is next week, the next few years, your lifetime or your children's lifetime, you're over here. If your space is your family, your neighborhood, your nation, but the world, and there's only a few people that think about the world in their children's lifetime, and we need to listen to them because they're smarter than we are. So, right there is where everybody lives. I've used the icon of uh, the bee, you know, leave it to beaver, remember the, uh, what was the name of the family? I've forgotten. But the nuclear family. Now down here, the poor bastard who works to feed his family the next week, he's very lowly considered by the higher life forms. <laughs> and then they explain to you in the text right after this page that they do inform, <laughs> they do live in that space. Now here's, here's the graph. I mean, there it is on pulp paper and it's irrefutable. This is billions of hectares of arable land, and it's been flat forever. Don't think so. I think it was increasing. And it's going to drop. Why? We're going to pollute it. It's going to turn into desert. It's going to dry up. Here is the agricultural land needed at present productivity level. Present productivity level. They kind of forgot Norman Borlaug here. And of course, he had already existed and made his contribution. And you see, basically, the population growth curve. And we're there. That, that's this heavy line. Now, what's going to happen when it crosses over, we have less land and we need to feed people and we're going to have starvation in 2000. That's what this book said. And then they say, well, what if we double our productivity? What if we quadruple our productivity? And they say, you know, it doesn't matter. It's either 2000 or 2050. The world's going to start starving. That's it. And I've proven it. And I have a model to show you. Malthus, alive and well. Not all academics were on that side. There was a professor at the University of Maryland named Julian Simon. I read some of his stuff. I never got to meet him. He's now gone. Um, he's an economist. In September 20, in September 80, Simon challenged Ehrlich publicly to pick a basket of five commodity metals. You see, we're using up the world's resources. Therefore, before they become non-existent, they'll become extremely rare. You know, a, a, a penny will cost $1,000, that kind of stuff. And Simon said, I bet you in 10 years, every one you pick will be cheaper than it is today. Well, how can that be if we're using everything up and we're running to the limit of resources? Ehrlich, uh, Stanford biologist, agreed. He selected copper, chrome, nickel, tin, tungsten, and he was sure they would be in short supply. Uh, Ehrlich bought uh, futures for $200 of each metal. Ten years later, the human population grew by 800 million people, and every single metal declined in price. And by the way, this is 1980. We are now 31 years after that, and the price of gold relative to the economy, GDP, is down again. You know, gold's expensive and people cry about it, but remember gold is 1000 bucks with Jimmy Carter? What is it today? 1300 I, I, I don't track it. So the point is, these metals, what's happening is we change. We don't just run them through the roof. For example, every chip we make that's bad, we save, we put it through a grinder, and the tiny little hair fine wires in the chip are recovered and recycled. And we recycle electronics like that because there's economically, uh, an economic driving force to do it. So Ehrlich had his wife sign, couldn't bear to do it himself, I guess. They paid Julian Simon 
and to show, show the true uh, mindset of the silk, they subtracted out the, worth, the highest bracket of federal taxes before they paid him, and I'm quite sure they gave the other $424 to the federal government. Here's a graph of the effect of pollution on lifetime. So this is the model, the one that's not perfect but close enough for you to make decisions. The model is good enough to run the world on. On the y-axis, we have the lifetime multiplier from pollution. So your life can be one, let's say it's 80. 1.5, 120, 0.5, 40. Okay, now, if things go unabated and we just increase our lifetime like we always have, which of course is what's happened, our lifetime is going to be getting longer continuously, uh, we'll get to 1.5. But that's not what's going to happen. We're going to have pollution. So this is the pollution scenario. Now, what kind of pollution? Lead, arsenic, chromium-6, not average pollution level. There's a pollution index. It goes from zero to 100. And when the pollution index is 25, whatever pollutants that is, uh, then your lifetime is going to be 0.8 of what it was. Now, if that model doesn't work, we'll create a couple other models here. You know, this is a, a clearly a declining exponential. This, this is some sort of sigmoid curve, and that one's a straight line. Close enough. It's got to be one of them. And then we plug this into this model. There's our model. Incredible. Think about the card deck they submitted. It must have been six feet high, and they ran in their computer, and they made all these calculations. By the way, every little box in here is about as screwed up as the one I just showed you. And they come out with their model, and we're running out of time. Third attack, 2006, an inconvenient truth. Intellectually exhilarating, the idea that worrying about the effect of carbon dioxide emissions on the world's climate makes you some kind of a liberal kook is as tired as the image of Mr. Gore as a stiff, humorless speaker. He is, rather, the surprisingly engaging vehicle for some very disturbing information. The images are stark, illuminating, and powerful. I can't think of another movie in which the display of a graph elicited gasps of horror. Well, actually, I, throw, I show a lot of graphs in meetings like this, and I typically get multiple gasps. Some, some of the guys heading for the back door, like a couple of guys couldn't handle it earlier. Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the United Nations Global Warming Group. They fly to exotic places in the world for about of half of their life at United Nations expense and talk about the climate with each other. The IPCC are the, the high priests of global warming. I'm not going to attack because they can't, because their scientists have spent their full life on this stuff, what they say. <clears throat> but I'm going to compare what they say to what's said commonly in the press, and specifically in the Inconvenient Truth. So I'm comparing the actual data from people who are biased toward a pro-global warming stance to what is being said today, today. Atmospheric carbon dioxide has risen. This is a graph going from 10,000 years ago to now. It shows carbon dioxide being relatively flat and taken off like a rocket. And if you expand the blue box, you see that carbon dioxide has gone from 280 parts per million volume to 380 parts per million in 2000. So that's that exponential rise there. So has the temperature gone up. So if you look over the last 1,000 years from 1,080 to 2,080, the temperature has been like this, thermometers, tree rings, etc. ice cores. I'll come back to ice cores in a minute. And the temperature is going up. Ergo, it's obvious, the famous hockey stick curve proves CO2 is causing global warming. CO2 is now newly being put in the atmosphere. The temperature is newly going up. Are there any questions? QED. Um, inconvenient truth, um, in my opinion, was politics, not science. Uh, the British government decided to show every school, uh, high schooler and, and preschool, uh, great, uh, what do we call it? 789, uh, Gore's Inconvenient Truth. They were sued. And the judge said this, schools will have to issue a warning before they show poop pupils Al Gore's controversial film. Gore's Oscar-whelming film does promote, promote partisan political views. Here's Gore blaming Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina on uh, global warming. It was implied, not said directly. Come back to that later. The judgment in the British court, and by the way, the British government is more left-leaning than our own with regard to global warming, said that there were 11 facts stated in the film that were challenged and were opinion, not fact. I'm going to talk about five of them today. The evidence from ice cores proves that rising carbon dioxide causes temperature increases over 650,000 years. Hurricane Katrina suggested had been caused by global warming. Polar bears have drowned due to disappearing Arctic ice. The Antarctic ice cap is also melting. 
and sea levels could rise by seven meters, 21 feet inundating many of our coasts. San Francisco Chronicle ran a little map showing Fremont, San Jose, Palo Alto all disappearing uh, when the glaciers melted and flooded San Francisco Bay. Vostok is in Antarctica. This is real data from a real scientific paper. You are here. You are going back in this graph 400,000 years. The temperature currently, it currently is normalized to zero. It has warmed up by eight degrees centigrade over the last 8,000, or this is like 20,000 years. Before that, it was hot, cold, hot, cold, hot. There was this oscillator. Okay, if you look at this time frame from the edge of the arrow forward, that period is 8,000 years. That data says to me that the temperature has been flat to slightly declining on the Earth for 8,000 years. And nobody argues with that. This, this is a paper from scientists. By the way, the way they measure temperature from ice, there's two isotopes of carbon, carbon-12 and carbon-14. Therefore, you get two kinds of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide-14 is heavier. And therefore, when it gets cold, carbon dioxide-14, which is heavier, tends to get incorporated in the ice more preferentially to the other. And therefore, the ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-14 is a very precise thermometer. So what do they do? They go to Antarctica, they drill down five miles deep in the ice cap, and they bring up the plugs, and they bring them, put them in a spectrophotometer and measure them, and they, get, they can get a temperature profile. And by how deep they are and other markers, they can tell what time was. Okay. Temperature's gone down for 8,000 years. The Earth has been as warm many times as it is today. For some reason, and no one knows why, for some reason, the Earth gets hot and then goes into an ice age, and it gets abruptly hot again and goes into another ice age. This is a graph of carbon dioxide, and you can see the carbon dioxide curve looks exactly like the temperature curve. So you could look at that and say, yep, more carbon dioxide, boom, more temperature. Less carbon dioxide, lower temperature, wrong. Another interesting point, uh, which is not causal but correlated, is the amount of dust. You see if there's dust, shortly after there's dust, there's a heating period. Dust, heating period, dust, heating period. And that you know, could be meteors striking the Earth, that could be volcanoes going off, no one knows. Now, I'm going to take this from 100 to 150,000 years, this little cycle right here, and I'm going to blow it up. Temperature in blue. 150,000 to 100,000 years ago, carbon dioxide in brown. There's a little problem with the causality theory here, you notice? It starts getting warm before the carbon dioxide goes up. It starts getting cold when the carbon dioxide is high. And after, the, after it's been cold for a while, the carbon dioxide goes back down. Now that's perfectly explainable to everybody. We all know carbon dioxide is soluble in water, soda pop. We all know it's less soluble in water at high temperature. Think about putting a Coke out in the sun and popping it open and fizzes all over because the carbon dioxide wants to come out because it's not as soluble. And this graph simply says when the Earth gets hotter, it boils carbon dioxide out of the ocean. And when the Earth gets colder, the ocean sinks carbon dioxide due to the solubility of carbon dioxide in water, well-known empirical phenomenon. The lag between carbon dioxide and temperature is 800 years there and 2,000 years there. So the causality, if you put carbon dioxide in the air, then it will get hotter, is seriously challenged by this. I'm not going to argue I know different, but I'm just saying I would have real trouble telling you it's causal based on that data. Second point is causality based on, on uh, fossil fuel. So here's from 1880 to 2000, 120 years, here's global temperature. Arctic is more extreme because the Arctic is dry, because it's cold, and therefore carbon dioxide is the only greenhouse gas where we live. The most important greenhouse gas is water. Uh, in the Arctic, the extremes are bigger because the only greenhouse gas to a first order is carbon dioxide. But you see, there is a global peak, a global warming that went for 40 years. And that all happened before we started burning a lot of fossil fuel. And then when we started burning fossil fuel, the global warming went down. Now, there is some correlation here. And this correlation, more fossil fuel, more temperature to the amount of a few tenths of a degree centigrade is the global warming argument. But to claim causality, you have a lot of trouble with that data right there. This is the IPCC report from 1990, the uh, United Nations group, Intergovernmental Panel. This is their graph of the temperature of the Earth ending in 1990, starting in 1080. 
and they even wrote in what they were. There was a medieval warm period, a little ice age, and then 1990. No one talked about global warming at that time because the temperature at that time had two attributes. One, it was cooler than it was in 1200 AD. Clearly, we didn't have a fossil fuel problem in 1200 AD. And two, it could be seen as a natural consequence of the warming trend after any ice age, including the Little Ice Age. How do we know there was a medieval warm period? Pardon, pardon you if you're Scandinavian. Hair jewel veins and brass lid, and, and there's all Danish settlements on Greenland. And Greenland in 1200 AD was farming, and it had settlements on it. Um, they started in 986, and they were at peak between 1100 and 1300 AD. The last Scandinavians were forced out in the late 1400s by the Ice Age. By the way, they are now starting to farm on the west coast of Greenland again, a little bit. Same group five years later. And they put out a, group, a paper about every five years. It's not exactly. Well, here's the new graph. There's the little ice age, which I had to draw in, by the way. They took out the annotation that this was an ice age. And there's the little ice age, and there's where we are now. We now have 10 years worth of data. So we see we've got from 1990 to 2000. There's a little uptick there. But you know, what happened to the medieval warming period? There it is. OK, they kind of forgot. You just cut it off. That data messes up your trend, so you just cut off the graph. And then the, and the medieval, medieval warming period disappeared. Now, oh, by the way, flash from Fox News. The medieval warming period has been declared to be heretical by the Holy Church of Global Warming and declared never to exist. Neil Cavuto. 2001, the next report. There's the curve. Whoa, now we go back to 1,000. So we go back to the time of the medieval warming period, which was the 1,200. But there was no medieval warming period. It disappeared. And we go to 1800, uh, you know, when we had the 17 to 1800 and we had the Little Ice Age, it kind of disappeared too. So all of it's gone. It's been normalized out. And this is, this is part of what you, if you heard about Climate Gate at the University of East Anglia, where the scientists were writing emails to each other about how to modify the databases to get the desired result. That was Climate Gate, where the medieval warming period and the Little Ice Age disappeared. This, I called it the famous, it should be called infamous hockey stick curve. That's the one I showed you to begin with. Then you simply lay that on top of carbon dioxide and tell everybody, there it is. Here's the two curves together. I think you draw a different conclusion from reading that curve than you do from reading that curve. And my question to them is, of course, when were you full of it, then or now? Next point, it's not at all clear that 380 ppm of carbon dioxide is bad. What should it be? 280? Well, why is that good? Because when you were born, it was 280. Your lifetime, you, don't, you shouldn't be using human lifetimes on, on, on a geo, geo scale. Um, 1,000 ppm using greenhouses so plants grow faster. In submarines, which can stay submerged forever because they produce oxygen from uh, electrolysis of water, uh, they control the uh, CO2 at 8,000 ppm. That's their safe maximum limit. So, so why would you necessarily pick uh, George Washington's uh, carbon dioxide content as the one that's the right one. This is a graph for crops, wheat, oranges, trees. The graph is for pink, today's carbon dioxide level, and blue, a higher level, 383 and 600. And the graphs say clearly that crops, all of them are going to do better. The world in a higher ppm carbon environment will be a lot greener than it is today. Hurricanes aren't increasing. This is the data of hurricanes that made landfall for the last 110 years. There's the graph. That's the least squares in line. So anybody that tells you that, oh, we have, we have you know, more energy, there's more heat, and obviously the energy is going to be dissipated in wind, and there's going to be more storms. Well, that's cool. I, I've got an article here I had to take out because of time. Yesterday I read, the wind industry is dying. Why? Because the wind's dropping. Why? Global warming. So global warming is simultaneously responsible for killing the windmill industry and creating hurricanes all at the same time. Here's tornadoes. Uh, this is the last uh, 55 years of tornadoes. Another, and as a matter of fact, if I put a line through the trend there, which wouldn't be valid, there's a huge error bar on this stuff. Uh, they haven't been increasing either. So that's just wrong. It's, there's no data to support those claims. Sea levels inundating San Francisco Bay. This is a graph of sea level from now going backwards to 24,000 years. The last 
ice age was here, and the sea level was 120 meters lower than it is now because all that water got sucked into ice caps, which, by the way, came all the way down to the middle of North America. And as you can see, for the last 8,000 or so years, 7,000 years, uh, the sea level has been very constant. So if you blow up this area here, again, you are here and, and the sea level has been stable now for 7,000 years. Here is the sea level for the last 120 years. And it has risen because the ice caps are slowly melting because we are getting, removing ourselves from an ice age at 20 centimeters. 20 centimeters in 120 years. This is what's going to inundate Berry Islands, dry people inland. And this, by the way, is IPCC data. This is, this is not an anti-global warming group with this data. This is unchallenged uh, data. Here's IPCC data. And it says we're, our ice cap under scenarios, various scenarios of temperature rising in their computer models is going to go up 7.9 inches per century uh, among these models. That's not 21 feet. If you go just a few miles of here, you can probably figure out all on your own, even without your geological PhD, that the water level was higher at times on the Earth than it is today. You probably can look at those lines and say, gee, it looks like water was eroding those places before. But if you lived, listen to the global warming people, the story goes like this. We started drilling oil in 1869. We invented the Model T in 1908. And when the Earth was almost gone, when there was only a little piece of land left that wasn't covered by water, that, that was the Dodge Hemi engine that was invented in 1969. Polar bears will be consigned to history, the World Wildlife Fund. If you dig back into polar bears and you read papers on them, which I have, uh, the, and which, by the way, comes from the IPCC. I didn't do this research myself. Uh, it's research published in 2001 by the Polar Bear Specialist Group of the World Conservation Union. And let me just give you the facts. It is reported that the global polar bear population has increased dramatically over the past decades from about 5,000 members in the 1960s to 25,000 today. That's because we're not shooting them anymore. Got nothing to do with global warming, and they're not going down, they're going up. Did you notice the nuance in the newspaper? Global polar bears have been declared to be threatened. Do you get it? They're not endangered, because endangered is a legal term from the Environmental Protection Agency. If you're an endangered species, all kinds of laws and things happen. But since polar bears are rapidly multiplying, they're not endangered they're threatened. So we can use a word that in English has the same meaning and glosses over, but they can't declare they're endangered because they're not. IPCC, current global model studies project the Antarctic ice sheet will remain too cold for widespread surface melting is expected to gain mass due to increased snowfall. It's getting thicker, not thinner. So what's coming off the top is going on the bottom. It's kind of like me. <clears throat> Finally, there is a, a, another group they call themselves the Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change, and they've got a Sears catalog with a bunch of scientific papers in it. They say, there is no convincing scientific evidence that human release of carbon dioxide, methane, or other greenhouse gases is causing or will in the foreseeable future cause catastrophic heating of the Earth's atmosphere and disruption of the Earth's climate. It is signed by 30 1,000 Americans, 9,000 of them, including me, with PhDs. So there is a growing body of people that are questioning the political, politically motivated, quote, science, unquote, of global warming. So my point to you is be faithful to yourselves. Be free market capitalists. Invest in things that have customers, that have real value, that your customers will pay you for. And the minute you start hearing how you don't have to worry about all that because the government will subsidize you or the government's going to force somebody to buy your product, you ought to think about it because I don't think there's a lot of money to be made there. Thank you.